I did stand up before you all the other day and tell you that Larry Jenkins pulled that trigger. I am not backing down from the fact that Larry Jenkins pulled that trigger. And what I knew when I talked to you all about that R. King Jones and Dominic McNeely were going to take that state. I had run their criminal history. I knew what they had been convicted of, accused of, and done in their life. I knew I was going to call them to the stand. Do you wish I would have had some choir boys, a couple nurses, some nuns? But I don't know if they hang out in the East Dallas projects. But I knew, I know who does hang out in the East Dallas projects. And you people pretty well know, it's typically the people who do dirt. They hang around people who've done dirt. And so I knew when we were going to bring those people to you, that you all were going to tell me, Drew, you cannot just rest on them alone. You need to bring corroborating evidence that tends to connect what they're saying to being the truth. And so we started. Detective Sayers, from the beginning, told you what there were always three names involved. It wasn't a year later that Larry Jiggy was involved. It was immediately. Who was involved? <clears throat> Keith Johnson, Michael Lucky, and Larry Jiggy. Detective Sayers told you that that was the initial tips we were getting. It wasn't a year later that this came about. No. Immediately. That's why I said, we need to look at the evidence that tends to connect each thing. So we started with that call. We started with that car. Alexa Aina's rain camera didn't catch it. But luckily, we had Justin Baker looking out his car. And what did he see? Larry Jenkins following Andre Emmett shooting at him. And another person running to that white Chrysler. So now we start with a white Chrysler. We got a good start. And then we brought you Daniel Murray, who said that he's on the front porch, and he thinks it's weird that a white crack with somebody in a red hat just got out just got out and went to the other car. He thought it was strange. He saw the police, and he decided he was going to tell them that information. OK? So Detective Sayers started an exhaustive search for white crack looking for any kind of ties to a white Chrysler. But remember, he had those three names. Keith Johnson, Michael Lucky, and Larry Jenkins. From the beginning, he knew that once he put that video out, that the streets would start talking even more. And with the help of Cindy Kovacs, guess what? We got a link. One of the initial names in this investigation, Keith Johnson, his girlfriend drives a white Chrysler. We got the paperwork. You can look at it for yourself. She bought that white Chrysler illegally. False pretenses. Charged with it. Charged with tampering. Guilty to those charges. And so now we have is there a direct link between Keith Johnson and Charlotte Fields? Yeah. We got pill bottles at the house. OK, so now we've linked one of the initial names to the car. What's next? We can put one of the initial names. Remember, the Texas Sayers said initially, Michael Lucky was involved in some way. Involvement being possibly being a shooter. But now we're getting him chopping, helping chop up the car. First, that Jerry Brazil didn't want to take. But then eventually, Marvin Eldridge crushed the car. No evidence could be taken from that. So we got one of the initial names associated with that white crusher. Now what we need is, is there any link between Larry Jenkins and that white Chrysler? 
Now, counselor, counsel will have you believe that for some strange reason, someone else is uploading photos and doing FaceTime on Larry Jenkins' phone. I don't know how many people who you all let strangers use your phone to upload pictures and do FaceTime. We talk about this photo. We don't know when this photo was taken. We know when this photo was posted. Everybody know who Frank Lucas is? It's not Larry Jenkins. So the belief that somehow Larry Jenkins is not with his phone, even though his phone is tracking on top of the GPS tracker. Remember I told you, they did not realize that there was a tracker affixed to that car. So when they're at theory, Larry's at theory. When they go to Whataburger, Larry's at Whataburger. When they go to Dre's condo, Larry's at Dre's condo. Then they go to 1810 uh, North Prairie, Larry's over there. They go back to East Dallas, over in Fresh Courts. Where's Larry at? Over there, visiting his girlfriend. I appreciate the fact that Jamel Hardy gave us that. Now we know why he went back to where he was at. And so now we have linked Larry to the Clash of 300. But here's what council has forgot to mention. Because there's one thing we still need. Is there a link between the person whose vehicle it is and Larry Jenkins? Yes. Remember, I went through those phone records. 30 minutes after the murder, Larry Jenkins is calling Charzell Fields. Why would Larry be calling Charzell Fields? Keith Johnson's girlfriend. Remember that you can take the records back. 30 minutes after the murder, he's calling her. You know why? Because it went bad. He pulled the trigger. There's no other reasonable explanation as to why Larry Jenkins will be calling Charzale. But I'll give you one. That it's because Detective Sayers said there are no other calls between Larry and Charzell. Ladies and gentlemen, a reasonable deduction is it went bad with Larry pulled the trigger, him and Keith got back in the car. Oh shit, we gotta call Charzell because we gotta get rid of this car now. Because Larry pulled the trigger. So to say there is no link between Larry and Charzell and Larry and Keith Johnson is a is, is just not true. 30 minutes after, right before he hit, right if he hit back over to Frazier Court, he's calling Charzell. Or they are calling Charzell. Because remember, they got back in the car together, drove around the North Prairie, and the two cars drove off together. Ladies and gentlemen, we knew that this was a circumstantial case, but these are the circumstances in which it is inevitable conclusion that Larry Jenkins pulled that trigger. That Larry Jenkins, along with Michael Lucky, other people, and Keith Johnson, remember one of the initial names the Texas Sayers had, that they followed Andre and set him up to rob him. But as Dominique Neely said, he asked him, because the streets had heard him talking about, why would the streets be talking about Larry doing something that Larry wasn't even there? Because he ran his mouth. Why did he shoot that man? He had his stuff. Because he ran. I'd do it again. So he told him. You saw the video, what did Andre do? He ran. And he shot him. And so our kid said, yeah. I asked me to close your mouth. He said, if I go down for it, welcome to the war streets. We all going down for it. He said, I had to shoot. So y'all think that our king 
And Dominique wanted to get up here and be labeled as snitches for a lie. See, Dominique was so honest with y'all. When Mr. Franklin asked him, why don't you call the police? He said, that's not what we do. But we're from, we don't call the police. There's this weird code of silence because it gets you late. Things happen to you. Our team told you that he told you before they shot him before. That's how you know they're telling the truth. They put their lives in the line. They can't go back to their communities. And you think they did that to, for some odd reason to put Larry in this? No. They put him because that's what happened because Larry, he messed up. They had Dre's stuff. They had it. But he saw his face. And he pulled the trigger and he shot him. He chased after the shooter. And then just kept on his day. And called Sharon Zell told him what happened. They said, you gotta get rid of the car. He's gotta go. They crushed him. Ladies and gentlemen, this isn't, this is evidence. This is evidence. We didn't just bring you a story. We brought you the corroborating evidence that shows that, you know what, these dudes may not be people I wanna sit down and have lunch with, but they did the thing that violates the street code, they told the truth. Now, counsel said that, our king out here said that he lied on people with bullet and Larry. He ain't never said that. You can request that record. Like, did he ever say, he, did y'all lie on you, you lie on me? He never said that. He said he was here to tell the truth. They got no deals. I cut no deals. Nobody. And they still came down to this courtroom to tell you the truth. You know how when you get no deals? That judge can for Dominique can say, I don't care. Whatever judge for uh, our king said, I don't care. And they would say, I came down and told y'all their truth. The truth of what they know, but what they were told. And again, when it comes to my notes with, with R. King, you guys can review the, uh, you can request the transcript. He said that he thought one of the voices was Pierre, one was Larry, and one was Keith. People, Larry, Keith. People involved in his office. Ladies and gentlemen, it is sad that the lasting memory that Andre Emmett had was being gunned down, crawling, asking for help to end his life. It is equally as sad that the last memory that Regina Oliver has of her son is him bathing his daughter and watching YouTube. But the lasting memory they will walk out of this courtroom with is hearing a verdict of guilty of capital murder. Not because of what I'm saying. Not because of what Ms. Omazi said. But because of the credible evidence, the corroborated evidence, the cell phone evidence, the car evidence. The cell phone call to Charzelle, because, man, you messed up. That verdict of capital murder, guilty, will be because those were not simple, but because we brought you evidence, credible evidence, a lot, a lot of evidence, painstakingly at time evidence, to show you that this man stalked this man, along with those that crew, and murdered them when he didn't have to. And so we're gonna ask you to find Larry Jenkins guilty of capital murder. 